Were the Victorians prudish? No, no, they were filthy, the Victorians. I mean, goodness me, I don't know if you've ever seen Victorian pornography, but it's full on. There are definitely questions you should never ask historian. You were tweeting <laughs> about the Dark Ages and yes. why you're stuff. Like don't mention the Dark Ages. Um, don't mention Dark Ages historians, they go bonkers. We get so angry, they particularly so the medieval angry. list. Never say, um, did Vikings wear horned helmets? <sighs> that is my, that is, that's, that one goes straight through me, I that one. Yeah. yeah, that's. That, that hurts. Quickly explain why. Well, I think, uh, firstly, massively impractical. I mean, if you got hit in the head with a horse, it would just go straight through your skull, you'd be killed instantly. But yeah, they don't have them. It's a 19th century opera tradition. It, it, it's just, it's Wagner. It's, you know, it's completely ring cycle. Was Julius Caesar born from a caesarean? No, so that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because at least you can see there's a sort of, you know, a linguistic link, but no. Um, you know, and, and Caesar salad also, <laughs> not him. Yeah, it's from Tijuana. That's a, that was a restaurant owner in Tijuana, I think. Um, did medieval people believe the world was flat? No, and that's a really common one. Isn't it? And we're seeing that coming back. And people keep saying to me, yeah, but you know, people, they thought the world was flat. He's like, no, they didn't. I mean, the Greeks knew it was, it was a sphere. Uh, I mean, even just a navigator, anyone gets on a ship, they can see the horizon dip down if you get up onto the, you know, it, it was just easy to prove with your eyes. You didn't even need mathematics or <laughs> astrolabes or anything. But no, people knew the, the world wasn't flat, although Columbus did think the world was slightly pear-shaped. But, you know, we don't love Columbus. He was a bit of a jerk. Speaking of Chris Columbus, oh, no. did you discover America, Greg? <laughs> God, I'm going to get cancelled, aren't I? No, I mean, he's, sort of, he's looking for India. He blunders into Cuba. He thinks it's Japan. I mean, it, he doesn't discover America. He discovers the Americas. But he thinks it's India. He thinks it's the Indies. He never sets foot in North America. I mean, the Vikings get there long before him, of course. Um, but, you know, it's still important. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about him, but yeah. Uh, were the Victorians prudish? No, no, they were <laughs> filthy, the Victorians. I mean, goodness me, I don't know if you've ever seen Victorian pornography, but it's full on. Um, they, no, they, they love jokes, they love slapstick, they love um, puns, they were quite naughty, they were very inventive. You know, if you look at early Victorian cinema, it's very, very clever and shrewd and funny and, and you know, this is 1895, 96, they've literally invented the camera, you know, the moving um, footage camera like that year and they're already doing really inventive things with it, including kissing, you know, they're, they're quite risque and yeah, Victorian porn is, you know, it's not just sort of people's ankles, so <laughs> no. Uh, did, um, did the poet have small man syndrome? He was average height, I mean, come on, I mean, we know this, I mean, I don't know how tall you are, but you, you tower over me. So I guess in, in comparison, I should have small man syndrome, but I don't even know if there is such a thing. But no, he, he's, you know, I think when we look at Napoleon, we see someone who is sort of driven by this impulse to you know, conquer and, and be glorious. But a lot of that we can track to his childhood. You know, and the fact he grows up reading obsessively about, uh, you know, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. And even when he's in Egypt, he's sort of fanboying about all the places that his heroes have trod. So. As a boy, when he was very small, in fairness, he was already an egomaniac. <laughs> He's already on that path. It's relatable, unfortunately, for me. Uh, did, <laughs> did Newton discover gravity when the apple fell on his head? So this is where we get into sort of uh, or nearly, but not, not entirely. I mean, obviously, the story is told to us from Newton's friend, um, whose name's escaped me for a second, but um, it's an antiquarian who tells the story of sitting in a garden with Newton and saying that, that was the tree where the apple fell and I first thought about it. So. Yeah, we're in a sort of ballpark sort of fair, but it's not quite true kind of territory. Okay, other questions. This is, excuse me how bizarre these are, but this is just a thing that's happening, Greg. <laughs> um, who's most likely to be best at speed dating, Napoleon, Anne Boleyn or Genghis Khan? <laughs> that's a really different mix of people, isn't it? Can you imagine that on Tinder? And you'd be like, Napoleon, no. Genghis Khan, t terrifying. Speed dating. And, well, I mean, Anne Boleyn played the long game. You know, she, she wooed Henry for several years, so I don't think she's the speed dating type. Oh, really? I think she'd be electrifyingly attractive, though. She was, so, she was super she smart. Was, she was not the most beautiful woman at court, though. She famously yeah. was slightly exactly. sort of average, but she was charming, charismatic, and clever, and that's what made her attractive. Uh, I think Chinggis, he had, a, he had an instinct. You know, he was, yeah. he, he knows, he's, he's pretty ruthless, but he could also be very, very loyal, so maybe he was sort of a gut-feeling kind of guy. So he may, maybe on a date, he would be... You know, he'd go with his instant urges and go, yes, you're the one, let's get married. I don't know. Um, who is most likely to get thrown out of a nightclub? Henry VIII, Margaret Thatcher or Boudicca? <laughs> well, Boudicca would burn down the nightclub. Yeah. So um, I'd argue there isn't a nightclub uh, to start with. 
Uh, Henry VIII would almost certainly just try and buy the nightclub, and then he would probably dissolve it. Uh, Thatcher, you know, she famously didn't sleep much, so she'd be in the nightclub till 3 a.m., I guess. Good, good point. Maybe. Uh, who's most likely to become an Instagram influencer, Newton, Charles II, or Matilda, Empress Matilda? Well, it's obviously Charles II. He, a man loved, loved pimping himself up for a party. Uh, he was very... Actually, one of the things that's interesting about Charles II is he's a very savvy um, manipulator of public image. And, you know, he would famously, he would have dinners in front of the full public. They could come and watch him dine. You know, he understood that connection between the king and the public, that, or rather his, his subjects, needed to be about one of intimacy. And so uh, he would be brilliant on Insta. When you were young, what big questions of history did you want to know the answer that you couldn't find? So when I was a kid, I wanted to know uh, how did knights go to the toilet in their armour? I've answered that in the book. When I was an archaeology student, I wanted to know how, how can you tell if a hand axe is a hand axe or a bit of rock. A piece, yeah, and I, I've answered that in the book as well, because actually that one, I, I spoke to Dr. Becky Rag Sykes, who's a Neanderthal expert, and she sort of walked me through how we do actually identify it. So that was nice. I finally got to answer that question. Um, if you could spend five minutes with one object lost from history on a table in front of you, what would it be? Object? Mm. Ooh. Um, oh, that's very frustrating, because I've, I've been tantalised yeah, by yeah. so many things that are lost now. I would really like to see Plato's alarm clock. So 2,400 years ago, Plato apparently invented a mechanical water-based alarm clock, apparently to wake up his lazy students, as far as we can tell, but we don't know what it looked like. And I'm just, yeah, I just, I'm intrigued. I just want to know how much effort did he go to? Surely you just clang a kettle, you just bang it next to their heads. Get up! But um, yeah, I'd like to see Plato's alarm clock, please. Um, okay, so if you had a time machine, would you use it to travel to the past or the future? Oh, oh, oh. Well, the future is going to be a kind of apocalyptic hellhole, right? It's going to be like super hot and, you know, sandstorms and a nightmare. So um, the past sounds safer, although, you know, plague, less fun. Um, I'm going to go back, I think, 1968, something like that. I want to go back. I want to see Jimi Hendrix play. Uh, feels like a sort of fun time to be, you know, young, going out to London, go see some bands. Um, the fashion's pretty good. Yeah. Um, who is one person alive today that we talked about in 500 years' time? Interesting. Yeah. And that's a really difficult question to answer because I think, I, well, I think one of the problems of being a historian is we just don't know how future generations will remember us. And in the book I've tried to answer that. Someone asked me, what will we be known as? What will our generation be called? You know, are we the Elizabethans? Are we the, you know, the internet people, the internet age? Are we going to be called the, you know, the screw-ups? Um, and so it's really hard to know who will be famous in the you know, in medieval times, right? Chaucer, Boccaccio and so on, they are clinging to the idea of glory and fame. And they're hoping that they will be known 500 years from now. That's what they were aiming for. So I guess if you were to apply that, that kind of model, I guess Elon Musk would love to be known in 500 years time. Um, but who will be known? I mean, it's, it, you know. Tough, isn't it? I would have said Neil Armstrong while he was alive. No, because Neil Armstrong is one of those fascinating, like, he was so famous, mm. and then he was completely not famous for a bit. Buzz Aldrin ended up working in a, a car dealership, and it was extraordinary. And he walked the moon, and he ended up selling used cars. And there's a kind of bizarre drop off the intensity of being ludicrously famous, and then the kind of the plummeting off. So, if you could be a flower wolf, particular moment in history, what would it be, Jimi yeah. Hendrix? Well, no, I mean I'd like to see him play, but um, fly on the wall. Ooh. That's hard, isn't it? I mean, what will you go with? I'm going to throw it back at you. Go on. Give, give I, would have see, I, I'm a, I would have seen, I'd like to have seen a, um, a big naval battle. Okay. The idea of 40, over 40 ships the size of HMS Victory all sailing around each other. So a sort of, a, a sort like, of the golden age of sail. Yeah, I find yeah. That just like a bizarre, like a totally extraordinary spectacle. Yeah, and the storms you get afterwards as well. Yeah, you know, that, the storm um, afterwards. Whereas I'd probably go for something a lot more tedious I'd probably go for like you know something small and intimate I'd love to see you know the moment that Leonardo da Vinci as a young apprentice painted a hand and his you know Verrocchio went oh, holy crap it's all right kids got game <laughs> yeah, you're good. Or, yeah. or fifth century BC Athens or I don't know it's just it's an impossible question it's painful to even there's ask there's a it. billion answers I'm you sorry, could give man. um which what the historical era would you find least appealing as a tourist uh, that is a good question. I mean, I think I would be fascinated by everything, of course, because we're historians, but um, 
I suppose I'm not particularly drawn to the 20th century. I tend to, you know, I do a lot of my work as pre-20th century because I tend to think the 20th century is very well covered by other historians who are much better than me at, at that stuff. Um, so I don't really have any huge inkling or inclination to go back to, you know, any of the kind of big landmark moments of the 20th century, other than seeing Jimi Hendrix play. That's my, you know, that's a night out. That's and not me. I'd be glad to finish the final question. If you hadn't become a historian, what job would you be doing? Oh, um, I always thought I'd be fascinated by neuroscience. So, I, you know, I, I'm interested in what makes people tick. You know, I think historians are. We are nosy. We, we are puzzled by human motivation and behaviour. Um, all those emotions of guilt and, and rage and ego and all that. And I, I think I'd like to know the kind of the chemical processes and the pathways and patterns that you know, give rise to those sorts of things. So, yeah, I'd, I'd probably go into brain science or something. Greg, I'm very glad you became a historian, though. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Cheers. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.